in the book The Notebook by Nicholas Sparks. I've already lost some points on my man card for some of you just by saying that, some of you guys. What? You read that? And in the movie that would follow, the whole story is about an appointment. We don't know that at the beginning. I, I remember not understanding completely about what was happening, but it was an appointment. And as we saw glimpses of their life begin to unfold, and as we watched this movie unfold, what we see is the love and the compassion of a husband being expressed for a, life, for a wife who has Alzheimer's disease. She cannot remember what her life was about. She cannot remember the beautiful things that they experienced together. She cannot remember those wonderful experiences they had with family. She cannot remember. And every day there is an appointment that is made. There is an appointment that is kept where, where the husband shows up with a notebook. And he takes the notebook and he reads and tells the story of a, a man and a woman who are desperately in love with each other. Having a father that is in the stages of dementia, I now understand the depth of that compassion more than I ever have in my life. Talking to my dad every week about the same thing that we talked about last week can be disheartening. Talking to my dad every week and listening to the same stories that he told me about his life last week and about the cat that we met when we were there and about the things that have happened and telling me the things that we just talked about, it can be disheartening. It can almost lead you to a place where you said, I, I'm not going to call this week. He, he'll forget by the end of the week and we're just going to have the same conversation. Oh, no. You see, there's a sense of compassion of saying, I need to have this connection, the appointment. It's important. You may have appointments that you look forward to. You may have appointments in your life that you don't look forward to. The older you get, the more we have appointments at times in our lives where they can be scary, especially if you go to the doctor. You know, you don't know what the doctor is going to say. Most of you who are so young that you've never had to worry about those kind of things. Some of you have experienced that. Sometimes appointments can be scary. Sometimes appointments can be incredible. But the appointment. This morning, we're going to look at an appointment. It's the most important appointment that's ever taken place in mankind. It's the most incredible appointment that's ever taken place in mankind. And Jesus is in the garden before the cross for an appointment. He's in the garden before he will hang on the cross for you and I. And a divine appointment takes place. Join me in John chapter 17. An incredible appointment is taking place. And let's look at the words of what Jesus prays for us. This is what happens. We get to see we get to see the veil moved back, if you will. We get to see what is on Jesus' heart as he knows that which he is about to face. He is about to go to the cross on our behalf. And what you and I get to witness is Jesus pour out what is at the core of his being. You would understand that if one was on his deathbed, if one knew that he was about to face one of the most important times and days in his life, that what he would be expressing would be the things that were of the very core of his being. That's what we get to look into. It's an incredible passage of Scripture. We could literally probably spend six months on one chapter. And so there's so much here. I've tried to just capture what God laid on my heart for today. But it is an incredible chapter. In fact, John Knox, the great Scotsman during the Reformation, he on his deathbed had his wife in 1572 read to him the 17th chapter of John's gospel over and over and over again. And the reason he said he did is because this is where he first cast his anchor. You're here today by the providence of God. 
Sure, you set your alarm and you got up and you made sure you came to church. You took the initiative to do that. But I do not believe in accidents in the providence of God. And so as I unpack some things in this text, perhaps today it's an appointment for you. At the end of this message, I'm going to ask you the question that Jesus has come to die for you. Have you been willing to receive his gift? That's where we're heading today. It's the appointment. And hopefully to today, through today, you will see this with greater clarity than what you've ever seen it before. John chapter 17, starting at verse 1 and 2. And Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven. And let me just stop you real quickly. That is one of the, you and I think of prayer as bowing our head in reverence and closing our eyes to eliminate the distractions that are around us. That's not anything that's taught in Scripture. There's nothing wrong with it. Bowing your head does show a sign of reverence. And, and closing your eyes allows you to focus. It is a good practice. But when Jesus went before the Father on this occasion and on another occasion when he uh, had healed Lazarus, when he was bringing Lazarus, the dead man, out of the grave, you remember that? And Martha's like, oh, don't do that. He stinks. Don't roll the stone away. And Jesus says, don't roll that stone away. And they're like, he's been dead for four days. You know what that smell is going to be like? I mean, it's going to smell like a, a freshman guy's apartment in there. It's not going to be good. All right, and so, and so he, he says, Jesus then doing the same thing he does here. He lifts his eyes to the heaven. That portrays for me a whole sense of confidence. There's a connectedness there that I get out of that. There's a confidence there that I get out of that. There is something unique there about the Savior that I get out of that. That when he talked to Dad, when he talked to the Holy Father, he lifted his eyes in a sense of oneness and confidence as he stood before God in this pivotal appointment moment. And lifting his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may be, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to whom all you have given him, that he may give eternal life. The first thing I want you to get if you're taking notes is that it is the time for which Jesus came. This is it. This is the culmination. This is the hour. That's how he says it in this text. The hour has come, he says. This is the pinnacle. This is the pivotal moment. This is the climactic moment in my whole walk on 33 years of ministry. This is why I am here. And what Jesus asked the Father to do is that he would glorify him that he may be able to complete, give, make available this essence of eternal life. You and I need to understand that this is the time for which Jesus came. This is it right here. If you ever want to know what the appointment is all about, this is it. Now think about all of these things that we mark time with. <laughs> I mean, we mark time with birthdays, you know. You, you get your first birthday, you don't remember it, all right? You know, with our kids, the most fun thing about the first birthday is, number one, you know, they like the packages and the bows more than the actual toy. I wish I'd have just bought a ball of paper, you know what I'm saying? But the other thing is, and maybe you've seen little brothers or sister do this or pictures of yourself, you put a cake right there in front of them, and then you just say, go at it. And that first birthday is so cool because there's chocolate everywhere. I mean, it's just spread everywhere, and it's so cool to see them do that. We mark life with birthdays, significant birthdays. When you turn 16, you get to drive by yourself, right, for the first time. Freedom! You're going, yes, I'm ready to go. 18, what happens? You, when you hit 18, you graduate from high school, and you're about to move into college. And then you hit college, and then the freshman year is marked by time. You can't wait to get beyond it, so people will quit calling you a freshman and selling you passes for the elevators that you don't have to buy anymore. And then you move beyond that, and you get to the senior year or your 
second senior year or third senior year, whatever the case may be, and you mark time by the fact that you're about to graduate and go into real life and become a real person. Or if you're in grad school, you mark time by the fact that you have X number of time left. You mark time by the fact that you may meet a spouse someday. And you mark time by the fact that this is when we married and began our life together as one. Oh, it's so glorious. You mark time by the birth of your first child. How did I ever get to be this old? You mark our lives by time. And Jesus said as he lifted up his eyes to the heaven, the hour has come. says, what I'm asking you to do, Father, is to make sure that they don't miss it. The Son of God would end his work of his earthly life by his death. The full scope of Satan's vengeance would be unleashed upon the life of Christ in this hour. In this hour, the wrath of man's wickedness would be completely maxed out, exposing the man's corruption without Christ in his heart and proving that without the Lord we are children of darkness. In this hour, messianic prophecies birthed in the Old Testament, beginning with Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where it says the serpent would bruise the heel of the woman's seed, would come to fulfillment in this hour. In this hour, Christ's love would be confirmed. God's stamp, paid in full, would be applied on the debt of every sinner that would ever exist as believers in Christ. In this hour, the altogether lovely one would die for the un lovely one. The cross became the vehicle by which God would be glorified. And he gave Jesus the authority to lay down his life on your behalf. There's never been a more pivotal day in history. There's never been a more pivotal time in your life. Even though you were not born, Jesus came to this place And when he prayed this prayer, not only for the disciples who were with him at that moment, he prayed that prayer for you. Because had he not, you would never have the opportunity for the appointment. It is the time for which Jesus came. Everything else led him to this place. Now here's what I want you to understand. If this isn't enough for you, if this Jesus' appointment, if that's not enough for you, he has nothing else to give you. If God's got to jump through hoops to get you to believe him, you've missed it. If he has to continue to do things in order that you would put your trust and your faith in his son, you don't believe that this appointment is real. Because history changed in this day. Your eternal life could be had after this day. And if this is not enough, that Jesus would, meet, would, would take on the entire burden of your sin, the perfect Holy One who knew nothing unholy, if it's not enough that He would take that on His own shoulders and die for you, He's got nothing else to give you. Because he gave the ultimate sacrifice. In Hebrews, that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 8. If you want to join me there, I'm going to read that for you. If you want to 
Just write that down so you can look at it later. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 8 says, For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, have been made partners of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then they have fallen away. So you've got people who've been around the church. Interestingly enough, all of those verb descriptions in there are not verb descriptions that are attested to or given to salvation anywhere in the Scripture. So we don't get the picture necessarily that these people have become believers in Jesus Christ. They are knowledgeable about Jesus Christ. They have been around the church enough to be able to see what the enlightenment is all about. They have seen the taste of the heavenly gift because they've been in the koinonia fellowship that comes with believers. They have been partakers of the Holy Spirit. As God's Spirit has moved, they have been present. They've seen it. They have understood it. And as, as they have looked and seen the, the good taste of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, they have come to this place where they see what the gospel message is all about. They see everything that Jesus is all about. And then their conclusion to all of this says, and then they have fallen away. In other words, they've looked, they've seen, and they've said, that's not enough. He says, it is impossible to renew them again into repentance since they again crucify themselves, the Son of Man, and put him to an open shame. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those, for those sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed. And it ends up being burned. He speaks of the steadfastness that comes with one who believes in the appointment. The fact that one that truly believes in the appointment will stay to the end. The fact that the one who gets it does not fall away. But he says clearly that if you have seen everything that God has to offer and said that's not enough, then you've missed it. Jesus comes to the hour and he says, it's the time for which I came. He was never, for, never more magnificent and majestic that in his death he completed his earthly ministry he died for you there was nothing that the love of God was not willing to do and to suffer for your salvation and redemption there was no limit for God's love for you the appointment Jesus said the hour has come this is it and the cross showed what men thought of Christ but the resurrection showed what God thought of his son guys this is important stuff because what Jesus has done has paid the full price in his appointment. It's the time for which Jesus has come, and it's also the life for which you search. Look at verse 3. This is eternal life, that they may know the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, some people will say, some false prophets will claim, Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. That's what they'll say. Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. <laughs> I was going to go, really? Well, let's just look at this verse because what he uses down there at the end of verse 3, he says, whom you have sent. Apostello, the one who is sent on behalf of the God. That is exactly what Jesus is saying. I am the Messiah. It's exactly what he's saying in the Greek. He's using a term that would say he had been sent from God. There's some other things he's fixed to say that would settle these issues. 
Back in, in other places in John, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth of life. No one comes to the Father except by me. I and the Father are one. No one is able to snatch them out of my hands. You don't think Jesus claimed to be the Messiah? It's in the New Testament. Don't listen to the false prophets. The reality of the fact is, this is who Jesus knows he is. But here's what he says. Not only is this the time for which Jesus came, it is the life for which you search. This is eternal life, that they may know you. They may know you. This is what eternal life is all about. We make eternal life, I think, a lots of times, we put the emphasis, I know I do, we put the emphasis on time. Right? I mean, you know, eternal. It's easy to focus that way. What is eternal? Well, it's forever. I mean, that's what it's going to be. Wow, I get to spend, I get to spend life forever. And when, as a Christian, I get to spend life forever in heaven with Jesus where there'll be plenty of chips and salsa. I'm just saying, that's got to be in heaven. You know what I'm saying? But away from Jesus, I spend still eternity, but I spend eternity in hell, completely separate and void from the presence of God in any shape, form, or matter. Now, that's hard for us to wrap our minds around. Even if you're here today as a seeker, one who hasn't decided what you believe about Jesus, let me tell you this. You still get the mercies of God in your life. You still are affected by the presence of God in your life. Because there's good here. There's good in this earth. And all good comes from God. Anything that is good and right and true and holy, and all of those things come from God. So even as one who has not acquiesced the mastership of your life into the life of Christ, you can be falsely, I guess, lured into thinking that everything's okay because there's still goodness around you. But in eternity, without God, never having believed in Jesus Christ the Son, everything that you think is possibly good is removed. I was sharing my faith with the man who was working on the gutters of my house one day. God just really kind of laid on my heart to pray for this guy the first time I met him when he gave me the estimate. And so I, I took the day off on the day that he was going to be working there uh, at the house. And I stayed with him just because I just sensed that God was just kind of, had just prompted my spirit to do that. And so I stayed at home that day. And sure enough, man, a spiritual conversation, it was like a softball lob, you know? It's just one of those things that you just kind of loft up and you can knock it out of the park. And so I had this conversation with this dude and we talked. And you know what he said to me at the end of the conversation? He said, I don't want to give my life to Christ. I don't know that heaven is the right place for me because all of my friends are going to be in hell. And I want to be with my friends. And I said to him, you will have no friends in hell because friendship is a part of the goodness of God that comes from his mercies and grace that pour out on life. And you and I cannot understand the fact that there's nothing good that's there. But Jesus said, I have come so that you, this is the eternal life, that they may know you. Eternal is eternal. But the word used here in the Greek is more about a quality than it is a quantity. It's the quality of life. It's that your life begins in other words, the picture that the Greek paints is that apart from this life, you have no life. Did you get that? Jesus said, I have come that, you will, that they will know that this is eternal life. And here's what the eternal life is. It's that they know you. This is the eternal life, that they would know you apart from knowing him, there is no life. It's not about the length. It's about the quality. And without the knowing of God, you have no life. You have existence, but this will end. The only way to know true eternal life is to know Him. And the term know here is not an intellectual no. Math majors in here, I applaud you because math makes no sense to me whatsoever. And so what I do is I look at the formula and go, pi r squared. Okay, yeah, whatever. No, my mom always made the pies round, but whatever you want to say. Old joke. Anyhow, 
You know, I, I mean, I, I get that. And when I, when I went through and, and did statistics and I got an undergraduate degree in business management, so I had to take stats and I had to learn how to do this stuff. And if I had to sit down and work one of those problems right now, I would just go ahead and turn my name in and ask for a points credit for that. And just, you know, everything else is an F. I mean, it just didn't click for me. It did not make any sense in my mind and did not work out in and through my life, which I know you math majors and, and all you, you know, the brainiac folks that do all this. I mean, you, you see the real practical principles that go with these kind of things. It never clicked for me. So it was just a matter of knowledge. It was just a matter of here. It never had any effect on my life. That's not the knowledge that's being used here. The knowledge that is being used in this text is about you believe in something and you act because of that belief. It is an intimate knowledge. It is the knowledge that is descriptive of a husband and wife knowing each other as they become one flesh. There is a level and depth of intimacy that is implied within this text that knowing God, knowing Jesus, knowing God is life. There's an intimate connection. There has to be a deep understanding of what this is. And it's not a one-time done deal. It is a present, active, subjunctive in the Greek. You impressed? I looked it up. All right. And it's used with henna. And when that is the case, the literal translation is should keep on knowing. It's a lifelong the present active subjunctive and the level of intimacy means that it's not a one-time deal. It doesn't just happen when you were 8 or 7 or 15 or 16. It's not just at that moment when you walked the aisle and shook the preacher's hand. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the fact that eternal life is so that they would know God Keep on knowing God. There is a choice that is implied because it is subjective. It's a choice that we make. It is a subjective text, meaning it's a possibility. It's a probability. But its outcome is not determined unless you choose. But when you do, what the Scripture says is that it's a lifelong process of knowing. It's a lifelong process of understanding. It's a lifelong process of life. Jesus came for the moment. The hour has come. Jesus came because you and I are searching for something that gives us a reason for existence. Not just the length of existence. Eternity comes. It's life that we're searching for. Next thing that Jesus says is that you are the reason that Jesus gave up his glory. Do you know that? Do you know that you are the reason that Jesus gave up his glory in heaven? If nothing else communicates to you how important you are to God, how much God loves you, then listen to verses 4 and 5. I have glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, which, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Did you get that? Jesus is saying, okay, God, I stepped aside. I took on Philippians chapter 2. I took on the role of a servant. I took on that which was less than who I am. And I did that to come and do what? According to these texts, accomplish a purpose, a task, that which God had sent him to do. And Jesus now says, now as this comes to the hour, the appointment, the culmination, God, what I'm asking you to do is to glorify me and bring me back into the glory that I had with you in heaven. And so it, it bears the question, what in the world was Jesus doing before he came to earth to spend this time on our behalf? Get this, this is what he gave up for you. This is what he's been doing for you. First of all, he created the universe. John chapter 1, verse 3. All things, were, 
All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created, both in, heavens, both in the heavens and the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him. He was in the process of creating the universe when before he came to die on our behalf. What else was he doing? He was controlling his creation and keeping it together. Colossians 1.17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He was also preparing his kingdom. Matthew 25, 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The word for prepared there is to get everything ready, to get the obstacles out of the way. It's used in the Orient for when some Chinese king or some Chinese leader was going to be traveling and somebody would go out, a forerunner, and that forerunner would clear the road to make sure there was no obstacles in the road, would clear the path, would make sure everything is ready. Jesus has been, since the beginning of time, preparing his kingdom. He was communing completely with the Father. In John 17, 5, the scripture we just read says that. If you look over also to verse 24 in the same chapter, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before what? The foundation of the world. This is who Jesus was from the very beginning. And here's the last thing. He was on the course in becoming our For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. 1 Peter 1.20 Guys, do you get the fact that you are the reason that Jesus gave up his glory in heaven with the Father? Do you get the fact that that from the foundation of time, Jesus has been moving toward the place where his kingdom is prepared for those who have life and will spend eternity with him. For those who would believe that he is the Christ. Not just in their heads, for James tells us that the demons believe and shudder. They don't doubt but believe to the point that faith informs life. That faith shapes our life. That faith changes our life. You are the reason that Jesus gave his glory to come and do the work so that when he comes again, gathers you into the place that he's prepared. There's one final thing about the appointment that we've got to see here. It is the name by which you are secured. This appointment, the name that Jesus speaks, that which he comes to make happen, is what gives you security in life. Look at verses 6 through 12. Let me just read this. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. And he's specifically talking about the disciples. All right? He's specifically praying about the disciples. He prays for the world in a few moments uh, later in the chapter. And he prays for those of us who are future believers. But he's spe specifically talking about the disciples at this point. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. And the words which you gave me I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you and they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours. And yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Holy Father. Do you see that term? It is an incredible, 
expression of, of an infinite holiness, but yet an intimate relationship. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Keep them in your name. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. There's a lot there, and I don't have time to unpack it, but let me just get you straight to the point. Here's exactly what Jesus is saying to them. It is the name of God by which you are secured. It is the name of God by which you are held fast. It is the name of God that holds you forever. And when he says the name of God, name, more so in the historical time of Scripture than now. But, you know, we, when we get ready to do, well, you haven't done baby names yet, most of you. But if you get ready to do baby names, they have these cool names, and you look it up, and you go, oh, what does this, you know, what does this name mean? Oh, it means, you know, the runner of the wind or whatever. You know, I told somebody asked me before, I said, what does Venable mean? And I said, the cattle are dying. I don't know what it means. I mean, so, you know, it's... You know, I, you know, you just go, there's a name, and the name reveals the character. And that's what, God, that's what Jesus is saying about God. In your name, it revealed his character. It revealed his stability. It revealed who he is. And Jesus is saying, in the name of God, nothing you or I can do to grasp, to hold on to. People say, oh, you know, you can just lose your salvation. And I'm going, if salvation is undeserved, if we buy into the fact that the Scripture says that it is unmerited favor, it is the grace of God that God gives us, how in the world can I un deserve something that I never deserved in the first place. I'm not held by my righteousness. I'm held by the righteousness of God. And Jesus says that it is in his name. Listen to what scripture says. And let me just say these quickly to you because some of you just need to know. First Peter 1 5. You who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. It speaks of how God holds us in salvation. Jude 1.1, 1, 1, to those who are the called, beloved in the Father, and kept in Jesus Christ. Jude 1.24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Philippians 1 6, for I am confident of this thing that who he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus. John 6, 37 through 30 through 40. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all that of all that he has given me, I will lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my father that everyone who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life and I will rate myself will raise him up on the last day guys you can live in security because God holds you with his righteousness and the appointment is the reason the appointment is the reason when Jesus came to this day for the appointment he says to God the hour has come it's time for this to come together we see Jesus as being so despondent and upset about dying in the, uh, you know, when he prays and we see that his soul is grieved and he, and he, and he you know, sweats drops of blood. And I don't know about you, but I thought, man, he really doesn't want to die. No, it was the burden for you and me that he was taking on in our behalf. He saw the significance of it. It's why, I'm, it's why I came down to heaven. The whole reason that I'm here is the appointment. And it's the life that you're looking for. And it's the name by which you can be held. And it's the one that will give you the life. Guys, will you put your life in his hands? You say, I've done that, Bruce. Okay. Will you keep on developing that intimacy and live like it? live like it. Maybe you say, man, I've just had all kinds of doubts in my life. I, don't, I just don't know if what I did at eight was real. I, I can't discern that for you. I'll help you walk through the process. But you ultimately have to make that decision. But guys, this is the appointment. You're here for a day. I'm no prophet. I can't speak for tomorrow. 
but I know that you're here for today. And the prophetic word of God has spoken. How will you respond to the appointment? Let's pray. God, thank you. God, thank you that you love us intentionally, passionately, overwhelmingly. God, may we give ourselves. May we give ourselves to you and trust in your name. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.